In this video, we'll learn about the echelon form of a matrix. This is the first in a series of videos, so look at the links on the side to get the next parts. So what is an echelon form? Well, echelon is actually a military term that refers to a specific type of military formation. In echelon formation, each member of the formation is positioned behind and to the right, or to the left, depending on the type of formation of the member ahead of them. So here's an example of planes flying in echelon formation. So notice that each plane is behind, and in this case to the left, of uh, each plane in front of it. So what does that have to do with a matrix? What does it mean for a matrix to be in echelon form? Well, for this we need to pay attention to the leading entry in each row of our matrix. The leading entry of a row is the first non-zero entry in that row. So let's just look at an example matrix. We want to find the leading entries and try to figure out where they are. So in the first row, the first non-zero entry is that 8 all the way over on the right-hand side. In the next row, the first non-zero entry, the leading entry, is the negative 1 right at the beginning of the row. The third row doesn't have a leading entry. All of the entries in that third row are 0, so there is no leading entry in the third row. And in the fourth row of our matrix, the leading entry is a 3. Notice that other entries in the row can be 0. We're just looking for the first one as we go from left to right, the first non-zero entry in a given row. So for a matrix to be in echelon form, there are three rules we have to follow. The first rule is that any rows of all zeros have to be below any other non-zero rows. So just think of the zeros, the, the rows that have all zeros in them, all sync to the bottom of the matrix. For rule number two, each leading entry of a row must be in a column that's to the right of the leading entry of the row above it. As you'll see, this is really the reason we call it echelon form. This is what creates that echelon formation. Finally, for number three, all entries in a column that are below a leading entry must be all zeros. So let's look at a matrix in echelon form, and let's go through each rule and make sure that each rule is satisfied. So for rule number one, we need to make sure that all rows of all zeros are below any other non-zero rows. And here we see that that happens. There's only one row that has all zeros, and it's below all the other rows. Now keep in mind that very often you'll see matrices that don't have any rows with all zeros. That's certainly possible. So this rule just says that if there happen to be any rows with all zeros, they have to be at the bottom of the matrix. So very often you won't have anything to check with rule number one because there might not be any rows with all zeros. Okay, so for rule number two, we need to find the leading entry. So just like we did before, we go from left to right and for each row, find the first entry that is not zero. And rule number two says that as we go down the rows of our matrix, from the first row to the second row to the third row, the leading entries must go to the right. So the leading entries go down and to the right, and you can see that here. Compare that to our plane formation, and you'll see that, again, this is why we call it echelon form. For rule number three, so for this rule we can just imagine drawing an arrow down from each leading entry, and make sure that those arrows go through all zeros, that everything below those leading entries is a zero. Now there's a more specific type of echelon form called reduced echelon form. So we say that a matrix is in reduced echelon form if it is in echelon form, in other words, if it satisfies those rules 1, 2, and 3 that we talked about before. And additionally, we have two more rules. Rule number 4 says that the leading entry in each row not only has to not be 0, but it has to actually be the number 1. So it has to be 1. And then for rule number 5, each of those leading 1s is the only non-zero entry in its column. In other words, those leading entries have to have zeros not just below them, which is what rule number three told us, but above them as well. So once again, let's look at a matrix and make sure that it's in reduced echelon form. So I've abbreviated the rules here, but just to give you the idea, rule number one says that the rows of zeros are at the bottom of the matrix. Rule number two says leading entries go down and to the right. Number three says zeros have to be below the leading entries. Rule number four says that every leading entry has to be one, and rule number five says that there have to be zeros above and below the leading entries. So for rule number one, again, there might not be any rows with all zeros, but if there are, they have to be at the bottom of the matrix. And in this case, that happens. For rule number two, the leading entries have to go down to the right. We're going to skip rule number three because, as you might have noticed, rule number five includes rule number three. Rule number three says that there have to be zeros below the leading entries, but rule number five says that there have to be zeros above and below the leading entries. So we're just going to check that all at once when we do rule number five. For rule number four, every leading entry has to be one, which again we can see that works. And then again for rule number five, if we check our leading entries, we look above and below 
and they have to be zeros both above and below those entries. So we can transform any matrix into a matrix that's in reduced echelon form using elementary row operations. But no matter what sequence of row operations we use, each matrix is row equivalent to only one reduced echelon matrix. So I might use one sequence of row operations to get it into reduced echelon form. You might use a different sequence of row operations, but ultimately we'll end up in the same place. We'll, there's only going to be one reduced echelon form. So in the next video, we're going to learn to actually do this. We're going to learn to use the elementary row operations to find that unique echelon form. And then we'll learn how to use that form to obtain the solution of a system of linear equations. So to get that video, just click the link below.